Welcome to Business Intelligence. This is Jonathan Diolio. Today we have a very special guest, Mr. Robert Bueso. He is an expert in what has to do with valuation. He has a doctorate in economics from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. He is a very affable human being who I am honored to call my friend. Welcome, Robert. Thank you so very much. I, I have to tell you that I am, I am pleased and honored to have been invited to come here and sit with you. No, it, it's a pleasure. It's a pleasure. And, and, and we coincide with the color of our ties today. We're on the same team. <laughs> uh, great minds think alike. Think alike, yes. Certainly. And, and you know, it is the season. It is the season, and I think it's appropriate. Most certainly. People can't see the, the green screen behind us, <laughs> but we have all the colors. Most Perfect. certainly. Most Perfect. certainly. Perfect. We got it covered. Yes, yes. Robert, we're going to cover a very inter interesting uh, subject. It's very abstract for a lot of people out there, and our job today is, is to make it uh, palpable in some way, shape, or form. What is valuation all about? Tell it to our public. Valuation is the art of coming up with a number of what a company is worth. But in order, that's the simplistic answer. In order to do that, you need to understand the market potential. You need to understand its past and its present. Mm. You, under, you need to understand the competitive pressures that they're under, the threats, uh, and as well as the uh, the opportunities they have to develop a business. Mm. And uh, in, in essence, what you look at is. Uh, future flows of income for as one method, let's say, and you discount that back to present value. But in order to, to start projecting numbers, you can't just do it because you want to do it. You have to understand what opportunities they have, what markets they can go into, um, what rates they can charge, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And that, that's, that's the definitive part. Sometimes we, we default to the SWOT analysis. And for those of you that do not know what SWOT stand for, stands for, it stands for, it stands for strengths weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. But when we think about those elements, strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats, we often fail to quantify those elements, if exactly. you will. Exactly. Now, are they quantifiable at all? Uh, most of them are. Uh, most of them are. The only thing that you cannot quantify is what is not uh, yet defined in the market. That you would consider a risk. Let me give you an, uh, an example of this. You have just come up with a new idea. You went to the patent office and they gave you a utility patent. Mm -hmm. A utility patent in the United States is worth, uh, is good for 20 years. So you would in the past think, I'm good for 20 years with this tremendously new idea that I have, mm -hmm. right? The problem with that is that today people look at that idea and they copy it or they alter it just enough so that it, a new product is made and what I've been trying to tell a lot of my inventor and uh, investors mm -hmm. uh, is that you have to, just because it says 20 years doesn't guarantee that you're going to have 20 years. The shelf life of an idea is getting shorter and shorter and shorter. That means that you need to get the money for it. You can't sit on it for very w way too long because what if you only have five years of applicable uh, usage out of it? Uh, you see that in broadband analysis where they went from 1,500 to 1,600 to 1,700, 1,700. They're now in Europe using 2,500. If you had the the patent or the, you had the permission or the license or whatever for a certain band, if it's uh, in bandwidth, if it's no longer being used, if it's not, it's more economical to use another one, then your your product is worth nothing. Uh, and, and that's the risk. The uncertainty is what you can't quantify. Mm -hmm. uh, what you can't quantify is what new idea is, is a guy like Bill Gates or Warren Buffett or someone uh, that's out of Silicon Valley or whatever that they just thought up and it's going to totally change the market. Uh, there's recent uh, uh, recent inventions that, that have come into, into play that have created new markets, totally new markets, and in the process they've uh, eliminated others. So supply side economics does exist. Oh, it does. It <laughs> very well. When we, supplied so when we supply something and that something caters to a latent need, the supply generates the demand. The, the, the question becomes, what's the time frame between when something is supplied and when something is actually demanded? Mm -hmm. uh, there are patents, and I'm aware of them right now, I've valued some of them, uh, on cars that use d totally different technology than what we're using right now. The question becomes, when can that become um, applicable given the massive infrastructure that we have already? If you're the the the, sh the the guy that takes care of uh, of cars as you know them now, what we call a mechanic, 
you know, and we have this picture of the mechanic in the 1950s and 1960s with grease all over his hands and uh, and wrenches. Mm -hmm. Now you walk in there, they they more look like they're wearing a white lab coat and they're they're putting in uh, computers to to uh, analyze in a very sophisticated manner. And they're very You're specialized. Right. Exactly. They're they're not a jack of all trades. Exactly. And so, a master of none. So that 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 requires a tremendous amount more education because mm -hmm. the, the the thing is so sophisticated, a, a lot more capital expenditure because the the systems are, are and then there's an insidious uh, un uh, unthought of consequence, uh, and, and that is that the dealers uh, receive the technology, but then the other mechanics may not receive it. They'll hold it back in the market for, let's say, two, three, four years before they release it, which means that uh, getting your car repaired is going to be more expensive because they're trying to maximize their profits during that, that short time frame that we're talking about. But uh, also means that uh, you have to get used to the fact that you're not going to be able to have your, your buddy, your next door neighbor, or, mm -hmm. or your brother-in-law come over and say, oh yeah, no problem, and I'll fix this for you, unless you're married to, uh, to Bill Gates' sister or something like that. You know? <laughs> certainly, certainly. <laughs> There's always that possibility. Of course, of course, <laughs> within the realm. Within the realm. <laughs> now, <laughs> Robert, we have a very specific audience here at Business Intelligence. Some, some of them are entrepreneurs that have been running a successful business for 10 years, and they're grossing say five million or ten million dollars in sales. They've never done a valuation. They have a product line and there's one product that is called the flagship product, right? Right, okay. And then there are many products that are, if you will, ancillary products. But they've never thought about placing a value on their product line and on the business that they've generated and accumulated over the years. They haven't thought about the life of that product line, right, right. and uh, they're making money on a yearly basis, but the fact of the matter is that the clock is ticking. Right. And say hypothetically that there are, that the flagship product has three years to go. Yes, what do you have to say to, to that entrepreneur? Just rest on your laurels, uh, start diversifying, start investing in research and development, what would you say to that well, entrepreneur? If, 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 in the applied sense, you need to tell them to go into research and development to come up with a new product mm -hmm. uh, and to uh, extend, try to extend the life of the of the product. One of the most the, the trite things is, you know, Folgers crystals with the new green thing. We, you don't even know if, the, if anything's been done. I'm assuming it was, but now they put little green marbles mm -hmm. in there and they say, okay, now this is a better product. Mm -hmm. um, that's that's a trite example, but there, there there are also other reasons that where the clock is ticking. Not just the length of the product, but uh, when you want to legate that, when you want to give it to your children or your grandchildren, mm. uh, when you want to insure it, you need a value so that you can get get it insured, uh, and you want to know the reasons why uh, in, in your product is valuable. And this the is, sooner this is done, the, the better. better. The better. Uh, if you go to the bank and you have an intangible, uh, a lot of times the intangible is put put in uh, put in there in, in an accounting format at book value. Mm -hmm. Book value is way 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 lower. You may be a much richer company than you are, and there are reasons why you would want to do that. Um, there are reasons why you want to do it uh, in financing and refinancing, in looking for new investors, in po potential mergers and acquisitions. Uh, in, uh, in so many, 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 many different uh, scenarios that happen in business. It's not just lengthening, the, the, uh, but it's also maximizing the, the, the economic and psychic profit while you're enjoying that wealth mm -hmm. uh, and that wealth generation that, that your product uh, gave you. Um, there are a lot of, uh, of issues that come up other than just lengthening the, 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 uh, the, uh, the life cycle. Mm. And one of the most important, but you hit it right on the nose, and, and, and that's commendable, but it is that, you know, how long will you be able to sell this? Mm -hmm. How long is your market going to last? How long is there an effective demand for your product, in essence? Most certainly. So it's, it's both time in the market and timing the market. And timing the market, exactly. Most certainly. Exactly. Most certainly. When we were taught how to do research in economics, we were taught to operationalize our variables, which is the same as to say to measure what we're trying to measure. Because sometimes we have certain metrics that do not really capture what we are trying to find out, okay? How do you develop these measures to value companies? Do you have standard measures 
or are they tailored to the needs, wants, and capabilities and the circumstantial realities of XYZ sector? Well, th there's a little bit of both. Uh, we do have standards. The uh, American Institute of Certified Public Accountants, the Florida Institute of Certified Public Accountants, the, uh, have a program called the Certified uh, Evaluation Analyst Program. Uh, the Appraisal Institute works. Uh, they have laid out uh, methodology um, in order to be able to say, well, you took it to this guy and you took it to that company, are they doing the same thing? And there are s uh, standard methods like discounted cash flow method, uh, the, there's the Gordon model, there's the um, book value, there's the adjusted book value, there, there's the, the IRR. Uh, operation, mm -hmm. you know, then you get into the, uh, the ones that are just uh, simplistic in, in nature but relatively easy to apply, which are ratio analysis, uh, multiples of gross sales, multiples of, uh, of, uh, of net profits, uh, there's capitalization of net earnings. I mean, there's a lot of standardized uh, things that you want to look at. And in the valuation profession, they've always, and even the Supreme Court, the United States Supreme Court has, uh, has, has addressed this subject, they want more than one method. Mm -hmm. Because one method may, may, may make you look too rich or too good, or one method may, may make you too poor. Depends on what you're doing it for. If you're doing it for a divorce, you know, if you're doing it for a merger, if you're doing it for this, you may want to use one method over another. So what they're trying to do is say, hey, wait a minute. Look at them all and then do a, do a form of reconciliation. Whoever does your valuation needs to give it mm. five, six, seven different ways to look at it and then reconcile. Well, look, mm. you know, if you look at the uh, P.E. ratios, it tells me that your company's worth 25 million. But if I look at that, it tells me it's worth two million. So where's the gap and what's the difference? That needs to be explained so everyone fully understands it. Most certainly. As you were sharing those nuggets of wisdom, I was reminded of the book of wisdom, Proverbs. Oh. Yes. There's Proverbs. a proverb that says that in the multitude of counselors, there is safety. I guess in economics, we would say that in the multitude of methodologies, there is objectivity in a sense. Right. And um, moreover, I think that it's very important to measure the things that we want to get because eventually what gets measured is what eventually gets done. And it's very important to place a value on the assets that we've created and generated. Correct. In order to add value, we have to define value in order to add value, isn't it? That's correct. Isn't, That's correct. Isn't that right? That's correct. But I'll give you an example of, of, of value. In the old days in the state of Florida, um, there was a law that actually ex uh, ex excluded foreign banks, quote unquote foreign banks, from competing mm -hmm. here. So there, was a, there were a lot of local banks in mm -hmm. Florida. You look around now, they're all gone. Back in the, in the 80s, uh, Citibank, Citicorp, and uh, Northern Trust found a way to get around that Maginot line that, that the state of Florida had built up. Mm -hmm. So even when you feel you're secure, your market can change right out from under you. In this case, I think it benefited the consumers, maybe not so much the shareholders of some of the other banks that were taken over. Sometimes yes, sometimes no. Um, you have to analyze everything. Um, but the standards are there for, for a reason. But then you also have to customize certain things mm -hmm. because there are certain people. For instance, I, I have a gentleman that came up with a technology, I can't mention it right now, but it, it would put all the cars out of business. Uh, if that th technology were implementable, mm -hmm. what would the market be worth? Now, that's the big if, if it were in the but, but mm -hmm. then you, you need to do some form of, of almost speculation. I don't like to use the word speculation because the courts will disallow that. And mm -hmm. I do a lot, unfortunately, a lot of my work in, in, in the courtroom where there's a shareholder dispute, a partner's dispute, or um, something went wrong, wrong in a mergers and acquisitions act or, 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 or something like that. Uh, and trying to unravel what's been done to see what is the truth, what ha actually happened, what are the causal variables that define value and took money from you or took money from me. And I think that is a fundamental question. What is the truth? And ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall and set you free. And we're going to come back with more truth after this brief pause with Dr. Robert Wessel. Don't move. <laughs> Welcome back to Business Intelligence. Today we have Dr. Robert Bueso with us, enlightening us in what has to do with putting a value on the assets that we've created and generated and the ones that we aspire uh, to materialize moving forward. Robert, this has been a very interesting conversation. Thank you. Uh, Thank you very much. Now, how can we ground this subject of valuation? 
who should be sitting down from across Robert Bueso and, and talking about uh, putting a value on the assets that they've accumulated? Uh, it, it should be anyone that is contemplating in the future having a merger or an acquisition, buying a business or selling their business. It should be anyone that uh, is thinking about redrafting or rechanging or recasting the, the value of their business for any particular set of, uh, of variables. It could be that they're um, interested in legating it so that there's a value established for the Internal Revenue Service of the mm -hmm. United States. Uh, there's, there could be someone that, that has an intangible that drives the rest of the company, a patent, uh, a copyright, uh, or several patents and several copyrights. The, the issue, uh, more often than not now, is the, 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 the intangible value. Um, it also could be someone, if you have international businesses and you have transactions between the businesses, what you want to make sure is that you have a report that is looking at how you handle the transactions because the Internal Revenue Service of the United States would like to tax you, mm -hmm. as would the government of wherever you have the other subsidiaries. And what you want to make sure or you want to try to avoid is double, triple, and quadruple taxation and someone coming in and putting a stop. You have something going, it's beautiful. You've created, it's the baby, it's grown into a beautiful teenager now, and it's about to become an adult and full-fledged business, right? Mm -hmm. And then you start having all those problems with the IRS and problems with the other the fiscal agencies all over the place, and now you can't concentrate on, uh, on growing the, the baby anymore. You're concentrating on protecting yourself from allegations or for paying way too much. So I think this has been the greatest nugget of wisdom that we've shared thus far in terms of, of the practical sense. Because if I'm understanding you, valuation can be a tax mitigation strategy. Yes, definitely. And a wealth preservation strategy as well. Exactly, exactly, exactly. Uh, there are a lot of different things that people like you know how to do that uh, can transfer wealth uh, faster uh, better and also uh, uh, lower the in, in, in a legitimate way uh, the tax bite that you're looking at. The other thing is that's very very important uh, with all this is how how you value uh, an asset and what methodologies you use when some of your assets are spread over different countries that have disparate accounting systems, different legal systems, and different ways of acceptably um, valuing something. Mm. You know, so you you need to be able to be cognizant not only of what the American way of doing things is, but it's also what is how, what's the German way, what's the French way. And you have to look at what does this balance sheet really say and how are they valuing. Because just because there's a number next to that, you can't assume that they do it the same way we do it. They have different and now systems. And that, now that you mentioned that, talk about the American way, the German way, the subject of culture comes up. Yes. And yes. sometimes the greatest point of differentiation, what makes or breaks a company, is its culture. Correct is its leadership, are the values that are at the core of XYC enterprise. How do we value values? How do we value leadership and effective corporate culture? Can we put a price tag on that? Uh, actually, one needs to do that. Uh, the most blaring examples are, you take people who are like Jack Welch, like uh, Diamond, like uh, um, uh, Sandy Weil, uh, who Leah Iacocca, not Leah necessarily. Iacocca, but <laughs> no, but, but you take people who have led their companies into something. What is that leadership? What is that vision uh, worth? And what happens if something happens to that man uh, or that woman? You can uh, ensure that vision? You can ensure that. I, I, in essence, uh, you do that with your key salesmen. You do that with your visionaries uh, in the firm. What are they bringing? What do they represent? If You have to ask yourself the question, what happens if tomorrow morning this gentleman leaves the firm? Or what happens if he mm. dies, or, or you know, or what happens if if he's incapacitated to the point where he can't intellectually help us anymore? Uh, how do we handle that? Um, that's a practical application. Another practical application is uh, in situations where people build businesses and then unfortunately they get divorced, uh, or the the partner dies. Mm. Let's say it's two guys and the partner dies. Then all of a sudden you have the partner's wife, who you may or may not have gotten along with. Mm, with you on that business and, mm. and then there are ways of ensuring that you, you can buy an insurance policy so that you can buy out the value of her shares but you don't want to wait till the last minute when that's done because then 
then you're already in a conflict of interest situation because you're going to try to undervalue, she's going to try to overvalue, but blah, 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 all those things that happen. And, and what you want to do it is do it when everybody's calm, everybody is agreeing. This is the methodology we will use. This is what's appropriate for my business, um, and, and we will have this in case something happens to me, or something happens to you. Then it's taken care of. With a triple C, with a cool, <laughs> calm, and collected. Exactly. You don't want to wait until it's l laborious, litigious, <laughs> and lame. And lame, right? of course. <laughs> definitely, definitely. Well, I, I think we need to do prior proper planning. And that's true. It, that's in order essential. to prevent piss poor performance, and and the sooner the better. I think from the very outset, um, let us not wait until catastrophe hits in order to ad address catastrophe. Sometimes we have to set ourselves, not sometimes, always, we have to set ourselves up for success and prepare ourselves for the unpredictable. Because the unpredictable, at the end of the day, is very predictable because it happens. Uh, throughout our lifetimes, we've had a lot of unpredictables. I'm sure you've had a couple. Yes, yes. Uh, I've had a couple at my short uh, life. I'm only 28. But as Francis Bacon used to say, a man that is young in years may be old in hours if he has wasted no time. So let us waste no, no time and put uh, value on our assets and, and define where is it that we want to go, uh, be it organically, be it by way of mergers and acquisitions. But we have to name it so that we can claim it, if you will. Exactly right. Exactly Most certainly. Right. Most certainly. Name it and value it. Of course. Name it and value it. I love it. Now. How can people get in touch with you, Robert? Um, they can call, call call me at my office. They can uh, email me, they, the, the usual things. Do you want me to t tell you the numbers and we'll stuff? We'll put like it that? on the screen. How's that? Okay. So perfect. if you want to get in touch with Robert, call the number on the screen, visit his website, and get acquainted with what he has to offer because this is very valuable knowledge. And as we always say here at Business Intelligence, the more you learn, the more you earn, the more you can return. Hey, that's very good. Isn't I it? Like that. I, like I wanted that. to share uh, a message with our audience. It's the holidays. It's the season. A new year is about to uh, ensue. And we always like to inject, inject hope in the minds and hearts of our audience. Because, you know, hope is what allows us to cope with the unpredictable things uh, in life at the end of the day. That's true. Very true. So what would you share with, with uh, our audience in this uh, Christmas season? One of the most interesting things uh, that I've been looking at lately is that there seems to be a tremendous more uh, amount more of international cooperation uh, and fusion between uh, uh, countries and economies. Canada is now considering becoming a part of the economic union, the European Economic Union. Um, the Econ uh, European Economic Union is spreading towards the east. Um, we in, in Latin America are integrating our regional economies more because people speak about globalization, but globalization is really a goal. Mm. Uh, I like to think of regionalization as in as regions become economic powerhouses. It's a piecemeal process. It's a piecemeal process. It's a stepladder approach. It's not a, a fluid function uh, where we're going to go from a totally isolated economy to a global economy. It goes locally uh, and then it, it, right. from there it expands. And we integrate it in stages. Um, to the, it seems to me that labor movement is being facilitated um, that uh, there, there's in Central America there, are, there there's, there's an approach of integrating the economies more and more and more. Europe is doing the same thing and, and as we see that then from my point of view from the financial perspective that leads to more opportunities and that leads to uh, a more profitability for the uh, for all st um, st segments of, uh, uh, of, the, uh, of the workers whether it's uh, the most uh, labor-intensive worker to the most uh, capital-intensive capital uh, type of work, uh, to the one, uh, whether it's the most specialized uh, brain surgeon or the guy that's digging a ditch. Uh, there are more opportunities to dig ditches when, the, uh, when they're integrating their economies because they're building more bridges, they're building more roads. It goes to, uh, to and what I'm seeing with, uh, with everyone now is that there seems to be at least a recognition that if we don't work together, uh, we're not going to get, uh, there's a mutual interest. Uh, I see that with how the Spaniards are coming back with proposals to fix their economy um, uh, after their, mm -hmm. the, the, the lamentable um, uh, poor economic performance uh, where they had like a 25%, 26% unemployment rate. They've now made some structural changes that probably will, will lead to, to a lot better thing. Mm -hmm. uh, Latin America is taking certain steps. 
to, to helping uh, its, its people grow, both in human capital and in, uh, in opportunities in, in different industries. Um, the United States, uh, yeah, it's a little bit more difficult. <laughs> the United States has so much potential. Mm -hmm. uh, actually, the potential is there. The, the, the only thing is uh, some of us just um, lever it too much. Most certainly, and sometimes at the level of uh, public policies, that's the problem. Um, it gets in the way of the manifestation of that potential, exactly. if you will. Exactly. Um, so I think that less is more when it comes to that. Yes. Indeed. I, Indeed. We have to get out out of the out of the way of good ideas, out of the way of innovation and leadership. Yes. That and in terms that. of you know our local communities, in terms of our local, state, and federal government, we need to get out of the way. And I think that's the message that uh, Dr. Bueso is uh, sharing with us. Get out of the way and get together at the same time. Build unity and the diversity of capabilities and potentialities that we have as a nation, that we have as a world. Exactly. Yes? Exactly. That, 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 it, the more we cooperate, the more uh, strength we have in, in, in union, uh, and the more we emphasize our strengths as opposed to look at each other's weaknesses, the, m the more we are willing to talk to each other. Uh, even old enemies become new friends, uh, and even uh, thousand-year-old hatreds uh, are, are moved over. I had this miracle. I, I saw it being built. There was a road being built between Bangkok, uh, between uh, Ching Rao and, uh, what was it? Ching Rao and Ming Rai. Uh, in Thailand to China, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, I was thinking these guys have been enemies for five thousand years. Uh, if you build a really good road, uh, all the Chinese have to do is take the road, and the uh, and the tanks are in Bangkok. But th they're no longer thinking of the way I used to think about things in my Cold World mentality because I'm such an old man. But they're thinking <laughs> more about the the uh, ability to increase commerce between China and, and Thailand. Uh, and, and that that was more important, and, and they're looking at if, if we're in commerce, we won't go to war with each other. Most certainly, most certainly. That that was the vision that John Monet and Conrad Adenauer had back in in the fifties right. when they formed the That's ECSC, right. the exactly. European Coal and Steel Community, and that is the message that we will leave uh, with our audience. I, I think that the Beatles articulated that message. Life <laughs> is very short, my friends, and there's no time for fussing and fighting. So let's get together and, and, and make some money and first and foremost, make each other happy and add value to one another in this holiday season and in 2014. Robert, thank you very much for thank being with us. Thank you so much. Blessings. I really appreciate it. No, 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 no. My, my pleasure.